So this girl walks up to the booth, and she she walks right up, and I say, oh, hi, how you doing? She walks up to me and says, hi, your music's horrible. And I'm like, really? <laughs> You're come up to me and just say that right off the bat? Last night a DJ saved my life. Last night a DJ saved my life from a broken heart. Last night a DJ saved my life. Last night a DJ saved my life with a song. Yeah, I kind of fell into this. I mean, when I when I left, uh, I graduated high school in 1986, and, <laughs> and I uh, I went to Berkeley College of Music for two years. So, and I went for music production and engineering and music synthesis. Now, back then, it was all tape machines, and you know, so it was pretty nice studios. But I wasn't really in the whole acid house DJ mode until after I got back here. And then that was like 1988, and it was just starting to blow up. And I was always into electronic music, you know, Kraftwerk and New Order and Yazoo and all that stuff. There used to be a radio station in Toronto called CFNY, where everything else around here would be all. So I was a, kind of the outcast there growing up in, you know, the middle of Sanborn, New York. But yeah, that's where I started, and then I went to Boston for two years, ran out of money, came back, and then, oh, this is kind of cool. So I got some, found some, you know, House Sound of Chicago compilations on vinyl and started to play around. I had two really cheap turntables that I learned on. Literally, the you, Stereo Advantage, when they were still open, they had... If you bought the cartridge for 49 bucks, you got the turntable for nine bucks. And they had, it was like a belt driven and the knobs are right down here. And I learned on those and then once I, uh, once I went from there and got onto real 1200s, you know, say like, I can mix on these for a while. And I got in 1200s, and I, this is a Cadillac, this is a piece of cake, you know. And then I'd step on and nobody knew, you know, when I just started to be around, nobody knew who the hell I was. Like, who the hell is this kid? And I'd step on and blow him out of the water because I could do it on the old turntables and they're just like, <laughs> uh oh. You have to work so much harder in Buffalo to get people's attention and to get a vibe going. So when I go to another city and I do the same thing, just, their minds are blown because I had to work so much harder and put so much more effort and you know, do a lot more faster stuff. So I get out there and they're just like, oh wow, that's fucking amazing. I didn't have good steady gigs until maybe six or seven years into it. I mean, my first years I got kind of lucky and did the jam club for six months, but then there was a dry spell after that. My next regular club after that was maybe a year after that, the Adventure Club. I played at Icon on occasion, but, but basically Adventure Club, and that was open for six or eight months. And then there was a long period where I was just, you know, making tapes and going to Toronto and doing things occasionally, but there's long periods where I was not working. I was, but I loved it enough and I kept at it. And then there's, you know, the opportunity would come along and I was like, oh, DJ contest, let's see what happens. And then I'd place second, or then I had to place first. And then for another one out here, I placed first and then got a gig that way. And, but that was at least four or five years down the line. And then it was, you know, there was like year six that I started at Marcellas every Wednesday. And that was like a first good steady thing for a while. And then built up from the Wednesday and then up going to, you know, Fridays and Saturdays. If I wasn't there every week, I was actually doing other bars in Chippewa and I was traveling to Toronto and doing all that. I wasn't there every week. But, you know, but it took a good seven years before you, you actually got to a reputation where you could do that. It takes time. You can't just... It's opening night for a theater district hotspot. Is this the start of Buffalo's revitalization? Club Marshalla, the latest new business to open downtown, and some say one more step closer to revitalizing the nightlife in Buffalo. And Marshalla's management has the thrill of being a partner in change. I've seen not that much going on downtown. Well, obviously, uh, people want to be uh, where the action is, so to speak, and uh, in downtown Buffalo now is changing. This area is becoming like a big Buffalo strip, and all the experiences I've had in the past of major cities, the more uh, businesses, the better for the area. Now, Marshalla is a gay club open to both gays and straights five nights a week, and already tonight, it is packed to the gills. 
are you serious? You have no freaking clue where your roots are? You know, if you had a clue about 10 years ago where you actually had to go to hear anything like this, you, yeah, it would be a definite culture shock for you. It would be a huge culture shock for you. That's the roots of house music is in gay disco. I ran up a credit card to do my first rave with Ed, who I met from uh, UB. He threw a party at uh, some skating rink in Orchard Park, and I run into that. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Hey, I do this, and let's find a theater and throw a party. That was 1994, the Ellen Terry Theater, which is now abandoned. That was our first party. And that was the party that I met Marcus and Scott and Chris, which ended up being the, a core nomadic tribe. And then 3PO came in a bit after that, and Mike Parker was involved for a bit, and there's Mattias who's now in Tampa, but that was pretty much the core of it, and I met them all that one, that first party I threw. First Nomadic Tri party was in the basement of the Lafayette Hotel. Oh, wow. But you know, I put some porta potties down there, and I went down. Didn't even need a smoke machine because there's just dust all over the place. I'm gonna get the uh, steak and eggs, the eight ounce, and I'll get uh, eggs uh, over. Not quite easy, but okay. you know, a little more than easy. The record shop, equipment shop I worked at at the time, just get an insurance rider, and then we are able to get away with it for a while. We are under the radar, and cops would even walk through. You know, kind of like they did with the Igloo party. Again, good job, boys. Good job. I cannot believe somebody pulled off a warehouse party. I mean, I stopped after 1996 when I almost got tossed in jail. And even though the place was trashed, and the you know, pipes broke, and it was just, it was just a night, you know. That end of it was a nightmare. That's why I don't put parties together anymore. I just don't have the, I don't have that kind of composition to handle that crap. You know, like I could never own a club either. You know, I might as well just play. Thank you. I'd much rather be the talent. But at that point, we had no choice. I could play my, you know, doing the stuff with my nomadic tribe boys and doing the parties. I could play the most twisted stuff imaginable. You know, I get to get all the twisted acid house. I could never get away with at a commercial club. That's the stuff I, that's the stuff I'd play in dirty warehouses. I was always the most comfortable in that time in the you know, 125 to 132 BPM range and sometimes I take it up there when I need to if I'm really playing trance but just keep it seamless and you build your BPMs up then you know I could go from 125 to 140 sometime. That was, I guess that was another thing I was known for is to have that variety of stuff. People would pigeon themselves into a certain sound and that's all they would play for their set. You know I um, kind of like the old school, you go all over the map. You know I would I'd, if you want to pitch it on my style, I guess it would be uh, funky twisted acid house with an old school flavor. I guess that's the best way to put it. It was all a wide variety, but in the end, it was always house to me. Doing this Moby show, I'm just like, I gotta, I gotta really lay out some stuff for them because I'm just like, what is there to look at other than me twiddling knobs? I mean, you know, I'm not one of these jackasses that could go out and throw a cake out into the goddamn audience right. or, you know, good though. or, you know, take the champagne and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's good. I, we like spectacle, you know. You know, nomadic tribes history, we always brought spectacle if nothing else. Yeah. And they, um, the people, the fact that people freak out, oh, he twiddled a knob. He called my one, that one custom filter that I programmed, he called that the, the panty dropper. <laughs> Dude, you turn that thing up and you just see panties drop. But that sound has come full circle. Now I'm in like, MK is like huge again 20 years later. So that, that house that house sound I was playing in clubs in 92 is back. Maybe a little bit more compressed and louder. It's a matter of, again, we're gonna tell new people, you gotta, got to have something that's going to differentiate you, at least orally, you know. It can't be the cake anymore, it can't be the makeup. Oh, I got this everything, I'm going to put a set out, it's going to be freaking awesome and the best there is, and I'll give it to him and he'll think the same thing too, and I'm golden. Then I'll have his job next week. And like and then you know they'll come up with that attitude and you know it's like, you know, give me a CD, it's like, yo, give me a gig. I'm like, what? Was that all synced? It's like, you're using the sync on that? It's like, yeah. Okay. Anybody that's going to be going to be a record bitch for me has to learn how to, or go learn from me, he's got to first learn how to manually beat match. You know, that step one. Yeah, you have to be able to do that. At this point, you don't even need to do what I've done all the years and be able to beat match for two or three or four minutes at a time. You don't need to do that anymore. But you do need to be able to at least do eight or 16 measures 
get from one record to another and make it sound good. You don't have to do that long stuff anymore. Everybody is now a DJ and that's horrible. So because the technology is to a point where you know you, know, you don't have to you know that that wall you used to have to have would be able to manually beat match and do all the stuff is a lot of the stuff is done for you technology wise. You know, it might impress a couple of your friends, or you might be impressing yourself in your head, but you know, then you actually translate that to have a crowd in front of you and then try to do it, and they, they, a lot of people are in for a rude awakening when they do that. Yeah, the ones that I really appreciate are the ones that are doing something different, you know, that grab my ear. If you're playing the top 10, yeah, the Beatport top 10, top 100 all the time, which a lot of people just do, they're too lazy to dig or whatever, or just don't know any better. They're not impressing me. I mean, I'll pay attention to the top 10, 100 Beatport stuff, generally the house chart, and even the main chart, but at the same point, it's just all, I've heard it all before. I don't want to sound like that get off my lawn dude, but, <laughs> but I've heard it all before, now get off my lawn. Yeah, you have to be in it for the right reasons too. You can't just be in it. It's like, yeah, yeah, this will get me laid. Yeah, this will this, this will get me a hot chick. Yeah, this will get me this. Yeah, this. Will, no, it's, it's not in the right reasons because there's gonna be so many ups and downs. And you know, I've had many ups and downs. And you know, you gotta be. You still at the end of the day, you still gotta really love what you do. And you gotta, you know, love love what you put out there and what you get back. If you're if you're not in it for that reason, then you know, there's no. Why should you be doing it? You know, house music in the end is a feeling, so if they're down with the feeling, you know, it's always going to be there. There's always going to be a hot, sweaty room somewhere where people are just going to get it on for a number, you know, three or four or five different hours. And it'll be, you know, all makes and all types of people. If you can step up and you can do a set, whether it's one hour or two hours, and within 10 or 15 minutes somebody can go, it's like, oh yeah, that's Exotech. Then you did your job right.